here. So Kevin, can you um, give us a bit of a background about yourself um, and what you what you do at the Institute of Export to help businesses? So uh, yes, my name is Kevin Shakespeare from the uh, Director of Stakeholder Engagement at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Um, I guess in, in the context of the Institute, we, we're a, a, a membership organisation, we provide training and education. And it's fair to say that post-transition uh, period trading, what we used to refer to as Brexit, uh, has, has kept us extremely busy uh, throughout the last uh, last months and years. So it's a topic we've we've done a lot of work on for all different types of businesses of all sizes, trading goods, trading services, uh, uh, different movements by by different modes of transport. So uh, very much look forward to the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Um, and sorry, Alex, do you have the slides up? Or? Here they come. There we go. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So today we're going to talk about trading in 2021. What will be different? So if we can have a next slide, please. Thank you. So sorry, Alex, if you can go to the next slide, please. Great. So just by way of introduction, I think of uh, when I came on, Alex was referring to this. Um, on the 31st of December, the, the UK uh, the, the, is the end of a transition period um, and uh, effectively UK uh, becomes a third country in its trade with the European Union. Uh, and there's a lot of talk in, uh, currently about will there be a trade deal, won't there be a trade deal. But for the purposes of a trade deal, the main factor to consider is, is that we will still have lots of changes in processes and procedures. For example, requirement for customs declarations and for safety and security declarations as well. So the, the, in, in theory, the, the best case scenario in a trade deal is that we have zero tariffs between the, uh, between the UK, Great Britain and the European Union. Um, and that's the best case scenario. Uh, but clearly tariffs are very important and, and can have a big impact on businesses and, and very much understandable. But even if we have a trade deal, we have all these other changes to processes which we will refer to today. Um, and the European Union have advised that all these new procedures will be required immediately from the 1st of January. The UK do have some element of phasing of what I call import controls through the UK's border operating model, which we'll look at. So we can have a next slide, please. Thank you. So we consider tariffs. Uh, the, there's, uh, I guess tariffs are, are like an, an import duty, an import tariff based on goods imported. So for goods brought into the United Kingdom, that would be UK, uh, an import tariff in the UK. For goods exported from the UK, that would, for example, be an import tariff in the European Union if there's no trade deal. So the UK announced its global import tariff, which will apply for all countries, all member countries, 164 countries of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Now, some products have a zero tariff. So there have been some changes to these tariffs and what was the uh, currently, which is the, uh, the common external tariff of the wider European Union. So some component parts have zero. Uh, and some products or more finished goods have a tariff, but it's fair to say products of animal origin usually have the highest tariffs. You can actually find out what your tariff is for the UK's global import tariff by going on the link, and these slides will be available to you, and keying in your commodity code. If you're not sure what your commodity code is, we will be referring to that later on, but it's important that you do know what your commodity code is. So tariffs are going to apply in every instance unless there is a trade deal between the UK and the third country, in this case, the European Union as a trading bloc. So trade deals do become important for the purposes of tariffs. But again, to be clear, customs declaration, third party conformity and regulation still exists after the end of the transition period, irrespective of whether there is a trade deal with the European Union. If we can have a next slide, please. 
So thinking about customers' declarations, this is one of the more obvious areas of, uh, of requirements. So every time a goods leaves the customs territory, so currently during the transition period, the UK and the EU have one single customs territory, the customs territory of the European Union. From the 1st of January, you're going to have separate customs territories, a UK customs territory and a European Union customs ter territory, of which, for example, Republic of Ireland will be part of the European Union's customs territory. So you, you effectively need an outbound export customs declarations when goods leave one customs territory. So when it leaves the customs territory of the UK or the European Union. And then you need an inbound declaration for when goods enter another customs territory. So you need two customs territories. And we're going to look at whose responsibility it is for those declarations shortly. But um, so, and it depends on the INCO terms, the international commercial terms, the terms of trade that are chosen. But irrespective of who makes the customs declaration, so if, for example, your freight forwarder, your parcel carrier, an agent makes a declaration on your behalf, you are ultimately responsible. And this applies for air freight, for small parcels, as much as it does for large volume shipments by, um, by sea, for example. So customs declarations are a requirement. Even if your small parcel carrier is making it on your behalf, you are still liable for that customs declaration. And when goods move between the UK and the European Union, two customs declarations, as we have seen, are required. If we can have a next slide, please. So responsibility for customs declarations and paperwork, as it's referred to, not the best term, do depend on the INCO terms. And those of you who are not familiar with INCO terms, we are going to look at some examples of it shortly. Selecting the correct commodity code. Now, some of you may be more than familiar with this. A commodity code is a tariff code, almost like a product code against your goods. And ultimately, you are responsible for having the correct commodity code because tariffs, licenses, any requirements are linked to that commodity code. You are responsible for declaring the correct valuation of the goods, which should be a legal correct valuation, and the origin of the goods. So, for example, the goods are of UK origin or European Union, United States origin, for example. You are the declarant of record, even again if a small parcel carrier, the freight forwarder is making it on your behalf. And you are liable to the customs authorities as that declarant of record. Impacts VAT. It, um, and all businesses should have a, a full proof of export or import file. Currently, that is only needed for trade with the rest of the world, for example, with, uh, with the UK to the United States. It's not needed for the European Union, but it will be needed from the 1st of January next year. So you need a full file for every transaction, which would include the transport document, the bill of lading, the airway bill, for example, and would include the customs declaration as well. So if you don't have that, you do need that as evidence for, 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 for VAT purposes, but also for customs audit purposes as well. And uh, um, customs declarations sometimes require licenses, depending on the type of goods being moved. And the trade documentation presented must be correct. So, for example, the commercial invoice. So we can see it's no longer just about the customs declaration and paperwork. There are a number of liabilities and responsibilities on the trader of having to make that customs declaration, even, as I said, if the parcel carrier is making it on your behalf. If we can have a next slide, please. So um, I talked about the UK's border operating model. So the UK is a sort of phased import controls. So effectively, um, full import controls will be in place on the 1st of July next year. And for imports of standard goods, um, so effectively that's goods that are not live animals, plants, uh, uh, are not excise goods or controlled goods, military goods, for example, uh, you will be able to defer making the full customs declaration and if there's any duty, making the duty payment um, uh, until the 1st of July. So if you were importing goods, for example, on the 1st of April, you would not need to, you, you can defer payment of that, uh, of any duties and any import declarations uh, until the up till the 1st of October. 
But again, the, the main benefit of doing that would be to defer or delay the payment of tariffs. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into too much that there is a process called entry into declarance records. So if you are a high value importer and you are concerned about tariffs, this could be a, an initial benefit to you. But what I would stress without getting too complicated is that businesses would need to look at other customs authorizations and other customs procedures like customs warehousing, like inward processing and possibly bulking of declarations. That probably would be equally as efficient for companies um, rather than the justice stage one process, which is important, but is only until the 1st of July. So that's the UK border operating model. But if you have excise goods or, or, or certain types of goods, you, you may also require um, export health certificates, for example, for products at, uh, of animal origin. Um, and you would need to pre-notify certain types of imports as well. If we have a next slide, please. And I appreciate in doing this, we'll have lots of different sectors here. Some of you will be more service sector potentially and, and uh, e-commerce. Now I've talked about INCO terms. For a lot of trade with the European Union, even with the United States for, uh, for, for the likes of parcels and parcel carriers, um, it tends to be certain types of INCO terms that are used. Um, now if you use another INCO term, that's really good. If you're using a C term, that's great. But there are 11 INCO terms, and, and a lot of trade uh, is effectively where the lorry turns up at the buyer's prem at the seller's premises uh, and just collects the goods. Or it could be where, the, where the, uh, the seller is responsible for arranging the freight to deliver it to the buyer's premises. So, so by doing that, the seller or the buyer are taking on a lot of responsibility in both. In, so if it's X works, so if you're selling on X works terms, the overseas buyer is responsible for collecting the goods at your premises. Now, that might be a, for a freight forward or a parcel carrier, but um, you, uh, they are responsible for the customs declarations, both customs declarations. They are the declarant of record. If you are selling on DDP, deliver duty paid terms, so you're responsible for arranging the freight to the buyer's premises, for example, you then are responsible for both sets of customs declarations. You are responsible for any tariffs. You are responsible for the VAT. And that would normally involve you obtaining uh, an EU EORI number. So you may be familiar with this term, EORI number, a UK EORI number. What you have currently is EU because we're in a transition period. From the 1st of January next year, it will be a separate e, um, UK EORI number, and you will have to get an EU EORI number if you're selling on DDP, deliver duty paid terms. Even if your parcel operator, your freight forwarder is making the declarations on your behalf, and you will be liable for the VAT. Um, again, your freight forwarder parcel carrier may try and assist you in that respect uh, there. There are other INCO terms, and, and again, this is not an INCO terms training course today. FCA free carrier, which is maybe more preferable for the overseas buyer to use than X works. Equally, you use delivered at place uh, DAP as opposed to deliver duty paid. Under DAP, the European buyer is responsible for the import duties, the import VAT, and the import declaration. So, Obviously, going through these points quite quickly, but what we strongly suggest is businesses check what INCO terms they're selling on. If they're not sure, they should speak with their parcel carrier, their freight forwarder, to be very, very clear on it. Um, if we have a next slide, please. Okay, so coming on nicely to post and parcel, so I'm conscious there may be some companies on the call that are moving goods by post and parcels, possibly of lower value. Um, postal consignments imported into GB by the Royal Mail still require, you, require use of CN22, CN23. So one way of looking at this is the same principles apply to goods moving between the UK, Great Britain and European Union as they do with the rest of the world, the United States, for example, from the 1st of January next year. Um, now, your parcel oper uh, operator may have uh, a special arrangement with customs to submit a bulk customs declaration. 
but again liaise with your parcel operator in that respect but do bear in mind you are liable for that declaration irrespective of the parcel operator making it on your behalf if we have the next slide please Okay, so I want to talk about special arrangements on certain types of goods. There was something called a low value consignment relief. That's, that's being withdrawn. So that's no longer going to be available. So the, the basic principle is in terms of VAT is the import VAT is, um, is uh, for goods less than £135 will not, no longer be due at the border. So businesses selling goods into the UK required to charge and collect any VAT due at the time of sale. That's an important principle. So to do that, they would need to sell on deliver duty paid terms and they would require to register for VAT in the UK and account for VAT to UK VAT authorities. If it's for sales for an online marketplace, it's the marketplace that requires to register for UK VAT and account for VAT. Now, UK VAT registered businesses uh, importing goods that have not been charged at VAT can still account for VAT on behalf of the overseas trader and, and claim it back under the reverse charge mechanism. So that's an important principle there. The principle primarily is that businesses selling goods into the UK require to charge and collect VAT at a time of sale. They can get the UK purchaser to, to do it, uh, but um, clearly they're putting a pressure there, whereas the intention is uh, it should be the overseas seller, whether it's the online marketplace, big provider, uh, who is... Um, who, who is effectively charging and collecting any VAT due. If we have a next slide, please. Now, something that has come in a fairly recent announcement is the bulking of low value goods. So it is possible to bulk low value goods into Great Britain after the 31st of December. And draft legislation is due to be published on the 10th of September. So the bulking provisions allow any authorised trader to declare multiple numbers of parcels into one single customs declaration, all bulked together. And that would have a reduced data set of information. So you can suddenly see the bulking for low value goods. Now, clearly your freight forwarder could do that on your behalf as well, your parcel carrier. Um, but that is very much apl applicable to where the overseas seller is accounting it so effectively um good is based on the place of supply rule with the vat being accounted for by the overseas supplier the goods can be bulked only when there is no vat for accounted for in the customs declaration because the vat is treated as supply vat rather than import vat so if you um if you are effectively having to account for the vat yourself as the importer you will not be able to bulk so the main benefits of bulking are for the overseas buyer, not for the UK purchaser. And again, happy to take questions on that because that's an important principle. If we have a next slide, please. Okay, so making a customs declaration, and a lot of companies, especially smaller businesses, will ask an agent, an intermediary, a parcel carrier to do it. Some businesses might look to, uh, to make customs declarations themselves. It is an undertaking. If you have lots of shipments and you're paying a lot of money in customs declarations, you may want to consider obviously making declarations yourself. The good news is there's a grant scheme at the moment, 50 million pound grant scheme for companies to learn about customs training and prepare for the, for the impact post transition period. So look at that, you've got the web link there to see if your business can, can learn more about what's in a customs declarations, what the legal liability is. Because for those businesses trading between Great Britain and the EU or vice versa, you've never had to, um, only, you've never had to make a customs declaration before. Yes, one can be made on your behalf, but you'll pay for it. Uh, but you still have certain obligations. It's down to you, the trader, to, um, to have that obligation of what's in the customs declaration. If we have a next slide, please. 
Okay, VAT implications. So leaving aside the small parcel side of things now and, and, uh, and the low value side uh, under £135, the UK is introducing postponed VAT accounting. It was announced in the budget, which applies for imports from any part of the world, uh, sorry, any member of the WTO, so and effectively rest of world imports as well as European Union from the 1st of January next year. However, imports into the EU, import VAT becomes payable upon importation. So suddenly there becomes a cash flow impact potentially for the, uh, the European importer. Unless they have a VAT deferment account with the local customs authority, usually supported by a bank guarantee. Uh, and in some countries, if you're selling on DDP, I've talked about if you're a UK trader selling on delivered duty paid terms, if VAT is payable, you are payable. In some countries, you may require a fiscal representative, uh, such as France, for example, which also has, um, has uh, extra workload and costs for the UK exporter in this case. If we have a next slide, please. So, so it's not just about the European Union. The European Union has 74 trade agreements with third countries around the world. And what the UK has been trying to do is sign what we call continuity agreements. So this effectively continuing what was the EU agreement uh, under a new UK trade agreement. And on this slide, you've got the web link as well. You can see countries where trade agreements have been continued, like so Chile, South Korea, uh, 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 Israel, Jordan, for example. But there's a number of countries where trade agreements have not been um, uh, signed yet or continued. And if we have a next slide, please, we can look at these. So um, these are where trade agreements are still in discussion. And we can see some big countries there like Canada, Turkey, for example, Singapore, so we can see there's a number of countries where the UK still has to try and sign a continuity agreement. If that's not signed in time, the benefits of the EU trade deal with these countries will lapse. And there will be tariffs which have been eliminated on the EU trade deal which apply from exports and imports to and from these countries. Now, clearly, there's a lot going on in trade negotiations. Japan is progressing. United States discussions have started on a trade deal, as have Australia and New Zealand. But obviously, that these would be new trade deals, so clearly the US trade deal would be a big one if it is signed, uh, which would reduce tariffs or eliminate tariffs on goods moving from the United States to the United Kingdom or the UK to the United States, vice versa. So it's not just trade with the European Union that's impacted, it's trade with the rest of the world and other countries as well. If we can have a next slide, please. So we're just going to sort of wrap up with some important aspects on trading services. This is not just about trading services. Some of these factors affect trading goods. GDPR, we're going to look at shortly. Intellectual property, we'll look at. Um, if there is no UK-EU trade deal, there are other factors that might be impacted. One is recognition of professional qualifications. It's going to be down to each EU country to decide if they recognise a UK professional qualification. A definition of what a short stay is in terms of visa, non-visa requirements. When we were heading potentially towards a no deal last year, a short stay was defined as any 90 days in a 180-day period which means that if you were working abroad for more than 90 days, you would require uh, more than 90 days out of 180 days, you would require a visa. Now, that's obviously still needs to be negotiated. So that's still under discussion as to what that will look like. If you're just providing services and not goods, it's very much business as usual as it is today. It's based on the place of supply rule. So, for example, a business in the United Kingdom, selling to a VAT registered business in Spain, the place of supply is in Spain. Businesses should look at their contracts, uh, things like arbitration dispute resolution clauses. Um, they should um, look at the ability to sell services. So some services like digital financial services, which have still got to be agreed in the trade deal, are still part of the agreement between the UK and the European Union because most of the discussions at the moment are around trade 
uh, between the UK and, um, and the EU in goods, but services still need to be discussed as well. And if, you ex if you're moving goods to the European Union that have a dual use, so for example, have a military use as well as a civilian use, you may require an open general export license when moving those goods to the European Union. And one example, which is quite relevant, is encrypted software increasingly requires export licenses because the potential end use could be for a, uh, uh, a, um, a, a nasty, difficult purpose. If we have the next slide, please, I think we have two slides which we'll finish on now. One is on data protection, GDPR. Now, again, the UK and European Union have to discuss data protection, GDPR regulation as part of a trade deal or separately outside a trade deal. And we would hope mutual recognition could be agreed of all data protection GDPR standards. At the moment, it hasn't been agreed. It might be, hopefully it will be. Uh, but if it's not, businesses technically have to look at what data they hold on addresses in the EU and the wider European economic area. Because technically they could be in, in breach of data protection in holding data from EU addresses, fax numbers, email addresses, etc., personal details outside of the European Union. Now, it's possible that if there, is, if there is a contractual clause, a standard contractual clause, that you will be able to hold such data. But what I suggest is you look at the data, you, um, your, what your standard contractual clause information contains, and make sure it meets the requirements of the guidance tool of the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO. And you've got a guide, you've got a link on screen there, which you can work through to, to, to see whether you are holding valid standard contractual clauses and not potentially in breach of GDPR. So very, very important. And that's data on, on employees in your company as well. If we have the next slide, please. Now, as we go towards the final slide, I, one thing I didn't mention is, is around EU nationals. So um, certainly all businesses should be encouraging EU nationals to apply for either settled or pre-settled status in the United Kingdom, uh, certainly before the end of the year. And, and a very high number, I can't remember exactly what the figure is, 1.5 million, 1.6 million EU nationals have applied for UK settled or pre-settled status. So very, very important, encourage your EU nationals to apply. And if, you, if you're a company, you have UK nationals living and working in the European Union, they should also apply for settled or pre-settled status in the relevant EU country as well. So the final thing I want to mention is trademarks. So trademarks clearly very important to all businesses uh, is, is that um, uh, the, the, the main impact is from the 1st of January next year, there will be a new UK trademark. So any current EU trademarks will also become, will be cloned into a UK trademark as well. And uh, if there's any pending EU trademark applications, owners will have nine months to fill a UK application, which mirrors their EU application, uh, from the 1st of January. So again, look if you've got any current pending trademarks as well. So just to confirm, current EU trademarks will be cloned and created into a new UK trademark for all holders of EU trademarks currently. So that concludes uh, my slides. Can I, again, slightly apologize for, for the delay in getting in. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and very happy to take questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was a lot of information. And we do have a few questions coming in and I've actually have some questions for you as well. Um, so we'll start off. First of all, we have um, Adam Smith. Now he was talking, he posted this around the time when you were talking about the 135 pound threshold. So he is actually going to be using a German supplier and sending goods into the UK. So what does this mean for Adam trying to import goods um, to private customers here in the UK post Brexit? Yeah. So, um, if, so um, first of all, what, sorry, I should say when we talk about UK, we're talking about Great Britain here, not Northern Ireland in, 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 in this respect. So we're referring to Great Britain in this respect. So there's a couple of things to bear in mind there. So if, if in this case, in case goods are being imported, um, 
and um, the, cons uh, the consignee is Adam's company, for example, um, then uh, the responsibility for declarations and tariffs and VAT depends on the INCO terms used. If the German supplier in this case is responsible, so selling as I've referred to on DDP delivered duty paid, they are responsible for all the declarations, the outbound declaration in the European Union, the inbound declaration in the United Kingdom. Um, so, and they are also responsible for any tariffs or VAT and tariffs if there are no trade deal. Now, if the goods are below 135 pounds, the, the, the requirement or it's, it's, it's suggested that the German supplier accounts for the VAT. So effectively, they are responsible for, for, for the declaration for goods with a value of less than 135 pounds. So therefore, there's no import VAT paid. The import VAT, uh, the VAT is, is, is accounted for by the German supplier. And they are responsible to the VAT authorities in the UK. They would need a VAT number and a, and a UK EORI number uh, there, and they would be liable to UK customs for the, for the VAT. They can also bulk the declaration. So if they're sending over lots of goods, um, on, on the same day, to, to they can actually have a bulk declaration, a simplified, shorter declaration to save them money. Um, uh, if, if, um, so that's really there. And also, no tariffs will be paid uh, if the bulking takes place in, uh, in, in Germany if the goods are less than £135, if that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. So Adam's just added on an extra little slide there saying that it is not to private customers. So in the case of somebody uh, sending goods to businesses in the UK, what happens yeah. in that case from outside the UK going directly to a business in the UK, a business customer? OK, yeah. So it's, it's exactly the same as I as, as I described it. The VAT should be all accounted for by the German, in this case, German supplier. It is possible as a business that you can account for the VAT yourself. You do have you you do have that option of doing that, but you can't bulk yourself. The German supplier can bulk as well, but the preference is for the German supplier to pay the VAT. I know that sounds strange because suddenly we're going to get a whole host of suppliers needing UK VAT numbers and being accountable to UK customs. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of changes coming, um, depending on who's going to take on the responsibility of the VAT um, and import duties and, yeah, what's going to be happening at that point. So um, there, that's something definitely you'd have to speak to your suppliers about, your freight forwarders about, um, or even your customers about, too, if they want to import the goods. Do you, can they use the postponed import accounting if the end business customer is the importer of record? Will they be eligible to use that? So postponed VAT accounting is, is clearly available for UK businesses. Okay. Um, but I think to the best of my knowledge, it's not um, well no, if you're if you if you've got a legal entity in the UK, you can use postponed VAT accounting clearly. Okay, perfect. So we have another question here. Um, talking about is the 135 pound threshold, is that for bulk or individual parcel values? So what does that contain, that £135? Yeah, so that's based on individual parcel value. So if you had 10, let's say, parcels of less than £135, you can bulk them. But let's be clear, the bulking can only be done using our previous example from the German supplier's end. Okay. And moving onwards, um, so it says you mentioned that to obtain an EORI number in France, it would require a fiscal representative. Are there any EU countries that don't have this obligation for a non-resident, so an e a US company, for example? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, on the Europa EU website, and if needed, we can provide a link. It has a, a link to the EU countries where you do require a fiscal representative. So France, we've talked about, is one. Germany, interesting, interest in, is optional. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, that means that sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Currently, the likes of Ireland and Netherlands do not require a fiscal representative. However, we would stress is that we are in a very unusual situation here with Great Britain and the European Union. And as potential debts to VAT authorities and customs authorities start to increase, it could be that more and more countries will require fiscal representative. 
or some form of guarantee from the uh, from the overseas exporter, because there's going to be more and more liabilities that are going to arise potentially here, where more countries could require a fiscal representative or some form of bond guarantee lodged at customs. Just because it's this at the moment, we're talking about a very unusual situation of a very high level of trade with the UK and the European Union. Now, whether that affects the United States is possibly a, a different thing, but increasingly if EU countries ask for a UK, uh, um, uh, a UK company to, to effectively provide required fiscal representative, they could ask the same of, of a United States company as well. Yeah, and I can add on to that um, from a VAT point of view, that as a US company, you would need fiscal representation in specific EU countries. Um, yeah, Germany, you wouldn't need it, um, but you can. the EORI numbers are also um, separate. And if you need assistance getting an EORI number, you can contact our team um, and we are helping uh, businesses get their secondary EORI numbers. We call them secondary EORI numbers. I'm not sure if that's the technical term, but um, because most people have a GB EORI number already. And then if you need to get an, a second EORI number to go into the EU, um, yeah, we're definitely able to assist. So you can reach out to us, Corey, um, and we can help. So we have lots of questions piling in. Thank you guys for, for writing them. And if you still have more questions, keep typing them in um, while we have Kevin on the line here. So Amazon suggests UK sellers selling into Europe delivered to EU customers on DDP terms. Does this mean that an EU EOR number would be required? Would the seller require VAT registration in an other EU member state? Yeah, it's a great question. Very conscious, if you like, of, of, of Amazon's policy here. And it's one we've obviously come across a lot. So, yes, does that mean the EUA number required? Absolutely, yes. And just with an EU EORI number, you need an EORI number from one EU member state, one customs authority. You don't need it in, in, the, in, in this case for, for, uh, from every EU country. VAT, however, is slightly different because if you're liable for VAT under deliver duty paid, you are liable to the customs authority of the country itself. So again, that's something to consider there in terms in terms of the impacts there. Um, so I don't know if we're talking about, presumably with Amazon, we're talking about one Amazon fulfillment center, but I appreciate that could differ whether it's uh, Belgium or whether it's Germany, for example. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I think also um, with the DDP terms, if you are going to be the, the importer of record, you do need to to have a VAT registration in each of those countries. Um, so if you're selling from the UK um, and you want to have an additional uh, or, you know, you want to continue using the distant selling thresholds and not use DDP um, going cross border into the EU, the best way to do that is to move um, your st some stock into an EU country, be re VAT registered in that EU country, and then um, continue to sell cross-border directly to private customers using those distant selling thresholds. Um, and I know my colleague Louise is going to be touching a lot on VAT tomorrow, um, where she's going to deep dive into it. And um, me being a bit of a, a tax nerd, it looks really exciting what she has lined up. So if you have more questions about VAT, please tune into um, the uh, webinar tomorrow. And again, you can sign up in the link in the description. Um, so just jumping down here, uh, let's have a look. So would it be best to send my stock, say from China to the UK and EU FBA? Are there better countries to have stock in FBA other than the UK for UK Amazon sales? I don't know, Kevin, if you can touch on this. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one here, isn't it? Because clearly, it it depends on on what the what the flow and the movements and the values are here. So clearly, at the moment, you can send it to one location in the European Union, and and the UK during the transition period is still part of that. So th th there does, in theory, need to be a split going forward between what is UK and what is EU, and and that in itself is I appreciate is is easier said than done for some companies. Absolutely. So that, that unfortunately is 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 the situation um, that we're in there uh, is 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 that there's that need to to look at what your UK UK values are EU numbers are and possibly have two, depending on what values we're talking about. 
Yeah, and I guess I, when it comes to um, which countries are the better ones to hold your stock in FBA, I wouldn't say that there's one better than the other. <laughs> um, but there, like we touched upon and Kevin touched upon earlier, is the fiscal representation. Some countries like Poland and Italy do require fiscal representation and then have those extra fees involved. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be the best country to import into, um, but it would uh, maybe Germany could be something that's more likely to go into um, you can import directly to final customers um, and or sorry even into a fulfillment center and send onwards to final customers so um, it would really depend on your business wouldn't it depending on um, where your end customers are and which ones are the best ones to target yeah no, I think to add to that we saw in a no deal last year we saw a huge push for companies to get EU VAT and EORI numbers and Ireland and the Netherlands were the two chosen because they seem to be the you know the best two. But we have been hearing some stories that Irish Irish uh, customs and VAT are saying that they may want, if there's duty payable, may want companies to open up a legal entity in Ireland. So there is that pressure where there is risk here, um, fiscal risk, that uh, some European countries might take a slightly different view because of the sheer value of money they could end up being owed. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I didn't realize that was happening. <laughs> it was only one rumor we've heard, I'll stress that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we have Emily writing in asking, if exporting into the EU on DDP terms, you mentioned we would be liable for import VAT. Is that VAT payable in the final destination country, example, Netherlands for a Dutch customer? So using your example, absolutely. If you were moving the goods there from, from Great Britain, to the, to, to the Netherlands, um, then then it would be effectively the VAT of the final. Now, it's an actually interesting question because it does depend on how the goods are moving as well and where the customs declaration is made. So clearly, if you're moving the goods from Felixstowe to Rotterdam or, or from Heathrow to, uh, to Schiphol, for example, then that's a direct movement from, from GB to, to the Netherlands. If you're moving goods, for example, through France to the Netherlands, then it depends where that declaration is being made. If, a dec if, if the first point of declaration is in France, the liability is to French is to, is to French authorities. If it's moving under transit procedure, and I'm getting technical here, then it would be Dutch authorities that you're responsible to. So again, a lot depends on how you're moving the goods. If, it, if it's air freight, if it's if it's if it's moving through France, I know a lot of freight forwarders are moving goods under transit, which means the declaration is made at the end decorator, uh, at the end um, destination, not at the first point in 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 the uh, EU. And the reason for that is obviously if you make the declaration in France, you need a fiscal representative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Perfect. Okay, so this one I've seen come through. What will be the effect if there was an understatement of goods? Uh, the goods valued in the commercial invoice. So I think they're talking about under declaring the value of yeah. um, of goods on the commercial invoice. What is the impact on that? What happens at customs? Do they really check um, everything going through customs? Can you give us some insight? It's a really, it's a really, really good question, actually. Uh, and technology is not going to be our friend here uh, for undervaluation. So currently, we don't obviously have to worry about valuation because um, there's no customs declarations. But customs declarations obviously require a commercial invoice linked to it as well. And that commercial invoice is the value which the company is saying is the value of the goods. Now, um, the, it's clearly important that the correct uh, valuation is, is actually quoted. So um, very, very important in that respect. So if there's an undervaluation, Customs could could perceive it as an attempt to obviously uh, pay less duty, pay less VAT. So that obviously has more severe consequences. And we know in intercompany trade transfer pricing that this that this this can occur. But the basic fact is the goods must be valued correctly. There is a tolerance level, and in the various rules on um, uh, on customs procedures you'll see what is included in the HMRC notice on what, what is viable to include in your customs valuation and not include. So there are things you can include in your customs valuation. But 
coming back to the point, will customs know? Well, possibly. I would stress, though, we're getting more and more what we call commodity code checkers, valuation checkers. So if something is undervalued and it shows up as, if you like, a red flag because it's undervalued, it could well be picked up. Okay. And um, I, this is kind of a question that I kind of came up with off the back of it is how do you calculate the value of goods going through customs? What is that calculated on? Um, do you just, do you just take it the, what the invoice was from the manufacturer or are there other things to consider, consider and add in to, um, into the equation? Yeah. So normally, you know, if you have component parts, you're going to take them into part, you're going to take account your markup into account. You are going to take things like freight costs into account. You, there's some element of, of marketing costs and branding costs that you can take into account as well. But the argument, that's in the price. If you've got a very strong brand, you're going to price it accordingly there. So um, there are some things that you can include. Um, but generally, companies would undervalue, not overvalue the goods. So if you're charging a very high premium because you've got a high quality product and someone's prepared to pay that, then that's generally fine. If you're undervaluing for purposes there, um, then uh, other than, as I said, through the commodity valuation checker, but there are reasonable costs that you can include, which do include elements of freight forwarding costs, packaging costs as well. So there are valid elements um, that, that, that you can include. The problem sometimes is, is that the undervaluation is, is to obviously pay less taxes. Absolutely. I, think, <laughs> and you know what? I think a lot of the time people think, you know, tax, you have, it is an impact on cash flow completely. And I think the UK government is trying to help at least UK businesses with the postponed accounting. Um, so that will be quite useful for businesses. But otherwise, the import VAT is always going to be reclaimable. It's really coming down to looking at any tariffs or, you know, any import duties that might be paid. Um, so, where, um, when it comes to tariffs, what what do you kind of expect? Are you, um, are you expecting that these are, are they large? How how much do people need to take into consideration for their cash flow? Yeah, I think it really varies on type of goods. Now, the UK has tried to be competitive in terms of component parts, so nuts and bolts, for example, zero. They used to be four or five percent. Things like shoes might be 8, 16%. Uh, so it really does vary on the product, whereas products of animal origin can be 59, 60%, which are obviously huge. So it does depend on the product. And generally, electrical manufacturing goods tend to be around 5 to 15%. Okay. But I would stress again that if it's a component part, the UK prefers component parts. It doesn't like finished goods because there's no manufacturing, no employment in the United Kingdom. Got it. Okay, so that will be a, a bit cheaper when it comes to that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, and then we have a question from Bryn asking, are any uh, countries giving British companies EU EORI numbers yet? And I've, I don't know if you know the answer, but I know the answer to this, if you don't mind me answering. Some countries are giving them out now. Um, however, you won't be able to use them until January 1st. So if you have them, um, you have to continue using your UK GB EORI number until the um, actual transition uh, period ends. Um, otherwise, you will not, it won't work um, and it won't be valid and your goods could be stuck at customs. Um, and it depends on the country as well that you're looking at. Um, some countries, uh, you're supposed to be EORI registered in your first port of entry, obviously, unless you're pre-planning all of that, um, it's a bit more difficult. So, um, yeah, so your EU EORI numbers, you can get them registered in advance. It would um, just talk to us about which country that you want to go into, and then we will be able to make sure that we're getting you registered at the right time. Um, when they allow, and I don't know. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Kevin. No, I think I think you're absolutely correct in what you're saying. So, absolutely yes. Perfect. Um, and Rachel here has written, um, "What is the customs declaration slash liability if we move stock from the UK to the EU in 2021, but retain ownership of the goods? So they're storing the goods, um, and they are moving between the UK and EU. What happens there?" So I guess it depends how they're moving to some extent. If if they're if they if you have a customs warehouse and it's moving under, uh, uh, effectively under under a warehousing process, you don't pay uh, duty until the goods are moved to, uh, into free uh, free circulation out of the warehouse. 
So um, in that context, um, the, 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 the liability in terms of duty arrives at a later date and that as well. In terms of the liability for what's in the declaration, however, you still need a declaration even if you're, move, you're moving goods under duty suspension. So your liability for correctly valuing the goods, for showing the correct origin, for having the correct commodity code, is to, uh, having the correct documentation, licenses is all still there. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll just answer these final few questions here before we end the day, because um, we're just past four o'clock, but I know we got a late start. Um, so if you enrolled in Pan EU on Amazon, how will this um, how will this work customs declarations wise? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So if you if you are delivering to different Amazon fulfillment centers and if they're telling you it has to be delivered to pay DDP, well, then, then you then you have a, a number of obligations there, obviously, in terms of both sets of customs declarations, but you have the VAT consideration there as well, where you're going to have to register for VAT in a number of European countries in the different destinations. And then we, as you say, if it's Poland, we've got things around fiscal representation to consider versus Germany versus Netherlands, France, etc. So there's a number of considerations there, but it does mean that you your your VAT registration is required in in the different Amazon fulfillment centers that you're moving the goods to. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, Kurt, as well, is that Amazon have stated as of, I think, July 14th, they put out a notice saying that they will no longer be shipping goods between the UK and EU fulfillment centers anymore. So that means you do have to, you know, the Pan EU is still technically operating within the mainland EU, but they're just no longer going to be shipping your goods um, between the UK and the European Union or mainland Europe. So you need to come up with those two different kind of supply chains to get your goods into mainland Europe as well as the UK. So you can't just rely on Amazon any longer. Um, okay, we have a question here about DDP. Presumably a local VAT registered EU customer could reclaim and um, that charge by the UK seller under DDP. So let me read that. So presumably a locally registered EU, that customer could become charged by the UK seller under DDP. Yeah, this is a really, really interesting one here. I have seen examples, and we've seen this from the UK, obviously not with the EU, the rest of the world, where the UK trader, uh, in this case it would be the EU customer trader, takes responsibility for the VAT and the recovery of it. Technically, so if technically is the right word, it's done. Whether it would survive scrutiny from customs and VAT authorities, however, is a slightly different question. I know it's done, and I can understand why it's done. But if anything's wrong with the claim, then obviously that becomes a slightly different thing there. And whether customs authorities or VAT authorities will become more dogmatic on this, especially in the case of liability, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting question so technically it can be done i know it's done by uk traders for for the rest of the world to if you like do a favor for the overseas company but technically the lot where the liability sits is a different question okay so um we just have one final question here um is what's the best way of finding indirect representatives in germany or poland and these indirect representatives are the representatives to get goods going uh, through customs and i know that um some clients of ours have had trouble going through customs because they don't have an indirect representative in germany do you have any tips on on this kevin yeah, I think in some cases your freight forwarder or your parcel carrier will, especially if it's if it's a large one, will have their own representation in the country as well. So that's one way there. But if you're not using a, a, a if you like, well-known established parcel carrier, they, they may have agents themselves or representatives that they partner with. So that's one way. But probably your freight forwarder or your parcel carrier is the big one in that respect. So contact them and see what arrangements they've got. 
Yeah, I think that's a good first step is check with your your current freight forwarder and then, you know, start searching. And from our experience looking for um, companies that actually offer the indirect representatives, it's kind of, it seems to be few and far between. But if you do need a contact, we can we can uh, try and refer you to some others. But I would start with your fiscal or your your freight forwarder right away. Um, and so I think that's all the time we have at, uh, for today. Um, and I've popped Kevin's link, or well, not Kevin's link, but the link to the Institute of Export above there. So if you have the chance, go ahead, check online. He mentioned about the courses as well um, to sign up to, to learn more about customs. Um, you can actually become a customs expert um, as well as there's loads of different resources online. Um, otherwise, we have three more days to go. Um, so tomorrow we are covering all things VAT and I saw a load of questions come in about VAT. So we have Louise tomorrow talking all about VAT post Brexit and how to best strategize or what options you have um, after Brexit or the E transition period. And then again on Thursday or Wednesday, we have exporting to new markets. Um, we have different marketplaces telling you how you can start selling on their platforms uh, to reach new customers. And finally day four, we have four awesome sellers that are going to be jumping online and they're going to be telling you all, everything you need to know to prepare for Q4 and Brexit. So there's so much content to be had. Um, thank you all for tuning in and thanks for asking your questions as well. And if we haven't gotten to some questions, we will be reaching out to you. Um, otherwise, we will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. And thanks, Kevin, for joining us today. And sorry about all the technical problems to begin with. <laughs> No, thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with me. And, and thank you again, Alex. And thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. See you tomorrow.